My guest today is Javier de la Torre. He's the founder of Carto, a company building geospatial data visualization software. Now, Javier started as a biologist researcher and retains a lot of that interest before moving into starting companies. I also wanted to talk to Javier because Carto not only builds software, but they also host and manage conferences, in this case, the Spatial Data Science Conference. Now, to me, the skills required to build software are pretty much as opposite as can be as those required to host a conference. There are other companies doing that, but they're still quite rare. So I wanted to talk to Javier about how he's thinking about all of this. We talked about biodiversity, the roles that maps have in preserving it, academia, companies, and of course, conferences. But before that, today's episode is sponsored by Felt. Felt is making mapping effortless for pros and those who work alongside them. If you're familiar with Google Docs or Sheets, you know how collaborative documents work in helping coordination and making decision-making simpler. That's exactly what Felt is doing for maps. Felt allows teams to collaborate together directly on the web and share maps even to less technically savvy members of the team, allowing for much faster feedback. They've invested a lot in making the use of their online maps as easy as possible thanks to their Upload Anything tool. As the name suggests, you can upload shapefiles, geojsons, geotiffs, but also regular files like CSVs or JPEG by simply dragging and dropping them onto the map. Their Upload Anything tools handle all the projections and formatting in the background. If like me, you work in geospatial data, you know that can be a pain. I think this is one of their killer features. And on top of that, Felt creates a beautiful internet fast visualization that you can share securely as they've recently been audited with their SOC 2 certification. Felt also integrates with QGIS users and speeds up your workflow thanks to their free Add to Felt plugin, which turns your QGIS map into an easily shareable online map. You can try out Felt for free at felt.com. Thank you to Felt for sponsoring this episode. I don't know if you know, I, I start these conversations the same way every single time. I like asking people how they would describe themselves. And so I'm quite curious, how would you describe yourself? Well, I think I'm definitely, you know, one of those uh, passionate people. And, you know, like very, most people would probably consider myself a little bit intense at times. Uh, <laughs> I can get very passionate, like I said, like, you know, on things that I like and probably also sometimes a little obsessive on, you know, on things. But, you know, like a very general, very curious person. It's like to see how things work, you know, like getting things uh, done, you know, like solving problems. So also pretty, um, I would say pretty social. I like a lot, uh, you know, like, um, I like, you know, like kind of with friends, family. Uh, I like personal relations. Uh, so I'm a people's person. Um, yeah, I think you know, like I also like a lot, you know, like things around. I, I like a good debate. Uh, that's you know, go back towards you know, like a little bit of my intensive, uh, you know, like characters. You know, like I'm, sorry, you you like a good what? A good debate. You know, like oh, to talk. a good debate. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> definitely, you know, like like challenges and like you know to challenge. So uh, uh, overall. Yeah, probably, you know, like, but if, if there's a word that, you know, probably will describe me, it's a lot around curiosity. Okay. Um, learning to, to around that. On top of that, I mean, I don't know. What do you want to know? No, but this is great. The, the reason I, I ask is, is I feel like it's a, usually an interesting way to, to start framing everything we're going to talk about. And so, like, you, you mentioned curiosity, for example. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Why, or, or, or rather, like, how has curiosity framed some of the things that you've done? There's a few things I want to get into. Like you started as a researcher and then you started companies. Like those are, are big shifts. And But I, I want to hear it from you. How has, you know, the, the curiosity aspect, how has that driven you to do what you do today? Well, in, in big ways, uh, in big ways, I, I think, you know, like uh, for me, I mean, if I look, you know, back at my career, that's, most people think that there's like a master plan to everything. That's <laughs> definitely not my style. So I, I'm, you know, I've improvised a lot in reality, and you know, like, and I see the uh, um, the different steps of my career to be, you know, sometimes a matter of you know, like luck, or you know, like just kind of like intriguing, you know, like moving in one direction or another, and it 
uh, going back to our curiosity, most of the times, just because I'm curious about, you know, like exploring um, something. So in, in, so in fact, if you know, like going from the really beginning, I, I remember before I went to university, I, I, I did one gap year studying English in England and uh, yeah, I, I used to work on everything. I work, you know, like you know, and as waitress, you know, like cleaning kitchens. I, I did the pretty much every job that you can think of. And and when I was going back from it, uh, and you know, when you know, like into university and so on, I did a few jobs already related to computer. I've always been curious about computers and from really, really early on. Uh, but there was a time when I, I remember that I did some of the first things that interest me. I said, like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to work again on something that is not interesting to me. <laughs> and I'm making that decision really early on and said, like, if I don't like what I'm doing, I'm just not going to do it. And I'm going to focus on things that I like doing uh, or that I find interesting, that I find, you know, that where I can learn and that I find, you know, like, curious and that I'm, um, I'm not, I will not do it. And that has really saved a lot my my career. If, looking back, I mean, because I wouldn't probably have started, you know, like my own business, my own consulting at the beginning, if it wouldn't be because I wanted to experiment with them, uh, with things. My my first company, uh, Visuality, was not really uh, again by design. It was I just wanted to do some science. Uh, it was hard, you know, doing, you know, through the public sector. So, uh, and a lot of it, you know, just was like, I just want to do these things. I just want to try to see how it works and, you know, and if it will work and so on. So, yeah. So in, in a way, I mean, like curiosity and the, and the, um, you know, always wanted to learn more, always wanted to call like, you know, like this mantle, call like break it apart, you know, try it in a different way. You're know, like, it's, uh, and even to today, I mean, like, I, the part that I like the most about my job in the day, and, and in a way, I mean, defines, you know, like what I do now at Carton Strategy is trying things and you're know, like, how this could apply this to that. It's, it's this curiosity about how things work and how they could affect other things. So, so big, big time. I'm, uh, I'm, my career is entirely driven by my curiosity to explore different things. So let's go to how you, when you started uh, Visuality. Uh, I'm, I'm quite curious because I was going through just uh, you know, on LinkedIn, you can kind of see the, the, the bullet points of what happened. And so you'd been a researcher, uh, from what I understand, up to that point, and then you start this company. And when I see something like that, I'm like, oh, there's there's probably a story behind that pretty big pivot. And so I'm curious. So if I remember, this is around 2008 that, that yeah. you start Visuality. So so what happens around that time? <laughs> That's a very, very interesting story because it goes back to us, you know, this curiosity part. So um, so I was, uh, I, I, I used to be a scientist uh, just after after university in, in Berlin, actually at the, at the Botanical Garden in Berlin. And uh, I was doing a lot of biodiversity informatics there. And, and yeah, we can talk more about that later. But then I decided to move back to Spain uh, because you know, like just my uh, my girlfriend at the time, so on. Um, so we we decided like let's go back and so on. And and I took a research position in the Natural History Museum in Madrid. Um, and while I was there, I was doing one of those. I was part of you know, like uh, uh, I was funded by uh, one of those European projects where you call like are doing research in a specific topic. And it was through that that you know like it, I, I was. I mean, I'm not going to say I didn't like it, but there was a lot of, you know, like uh, a bureaucracy and there was a lot of, you know, like things that I wasn't too happy around it. So I, so to the point that I said, you know, I, I give up. I'm I'm not going to do this. I, I just spend too much time, you know, like just doing reporting and things that I don't find interesting. So, so I actually, at that point, I, uh, I passed through a, another company in between to help some friends. But then I decided, you know what, I'm going to do, a, I'm going to take a sabbatical time and I'm going to... Uh, to just uh, do what I want. So um, so what I did was uh, I started, you know, like doing my own research, but, you know, like not, not associated, you know, with a public institution. And the way that I started really is I, I started a blog uh, called, which it probably still exists. Uh, it was called Biodivertido, like in the context of biodiversity and divertido as in fan in Spanish. And and I started just publishing there, you know, like uh, some of the analysis and some of the experiments that I was having fun doing. And it was through that process, I think it was no more than a couple of months of, you know, just being or less than that, that uh, an organization, um, in this case, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, is a global organization working on biodiversity data. 
and reach to me and say like, we've seen, you know, what you're publishing in the blog and we like it very much, this type of analysis. I was looking at, you know, like the, the impact of climate change on protected areas. And essentially you're like, how effective will they be in different climate change scenarios? And, and so they say, we're interested in this type of, uh, of analysis that you are doing. I say, uh, and they and they essentially say, like, would you would you be willing, you know, to to contract with us and you just to keep doing what you are doing and we will pay you? I was sure, why not? I mean, like, happy, <laughs> yeah, to, pretty good. happy to do it. And so I started uh, working with some colleagues, and you know, we're also kind of like I had some friends who were publishing with me on this blog post, and and then that kind of I think you know, like suddenly I needed you know some help because it was a lot of work, so I hired you know one person, and then you know like without realizing uh, we were a company, and so you see like so going back to us, it was not by design to make a company, it was the uh, the the we I was really I really wanted to do these things. And at some point, it was too big the challenge to do it on my own and started hiring people. And then suddenly it was a company. But, you know, like it was really uh, just uh, purely out of, you know, the curiosity of experimenting on these topics. And, and someone wanted to fund it and we would say, sure, happy to, happy to get paid to do what I like. Yeah. And so that project is what led to visuality? Yes. So at that point, then the uh, company, there was, uh, we actually had a company in between called, it was maybe too, too geek, definitely. It was called Biodiversity Overlay, which probably is understood on this audience, considering overlay as an overlay on the map. Yeah. So the idea was like, we're just like, we are the overlay of biodiversity to your map. That was the idea behind it. Then it was like, maybe it's not too much of a marketing name. So we, <laughs> so we, <laughs> I think it was six, uh, six months after we rebranded with visuality with the idea of uh, visualization and biodiversity. So it's a mix of the two, visuality. Right. That was the idea with it. And at that point, we, we were starting to shape also more the uh, uh, the vision of really what, what we were trying to do as a consulting firm, right? So um, we were working with this international organization. First was this GBIF that I was mentioning, but then we worked with the World Conservation Monitoring Center on the World Database on Protected Areas. I mean, and there was a number of, you know, like projects that we started working around biodiversity, conservation, climate change. And, and for us, kind of like I started, you know, shaping the idea of like uh, our goal was to, um, and this is interesting because at, the, at that time, my vision was um, there is this gap which was also, in a way, you know, what drove me really disengaged with the science. So you have to think that, you know, I was coming from the almost the taxonomic world, right? So I was a I was part of a taxonomic uh, research group, right? Sorry, uh, what is taxonomic? Uh, a taxonomy. So, you know, like a group that actually kind of like identifies species and put names to a species and okay. organize them. Right. So, um, which is a pretty kind of like hardcore kind of like uh, bio, uh, biology kind of like discipline and, and very rule-based. And, and if you look at all the science that they were doing, you know, like in publishing, it also didn't feel like they were actually making much of a good for conservation. So we would be publishing papers, but nothing would actually be help. And at that point, I mean, like my, one of the reasons, you know, like got really into biodiversity studies was and, and study visuality was to actually really help, um, you know, like to, to drive society to a more uh, sustainable and you know like and really focus on conservation one of the one of the things i care a lot is around you know this sixth extinction extinction that we're living now with biodiversity kind of like disappearing at incredible rates as one well. that's something that really makes me sad um and you know in a way i mean like that was my motivation towards biodiversity study so we studying you know what i want to protect so so you know, so what happened at the uh, at the pine is like we were doing all the scientific papers, but they were not, we were not really helping conservation projects. So with visuality, the idea was like, what if instead of focusing on just doing research, what if we actually call like enable organizations to make their their data to make their the projects much more visible, more 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 accessible to bridge what we call bridge the gap the gap between science and policy making. So instead of you know just studying this beautiful you know butterflies and plants you know like in these places what if we could actually kind of like help you know like drive better the decision towards you know like how how to um do an environmental impact assessment something like that right so so it was we, we felt and we saw and still it is the case that 
uh, science is like 10, 15 years ahead of you know what policy then uses to drive the decisions around conservation. And this is something that drives me nuts because in a way it's an information problem. Um, and, and that was uh, in a way you know the, the beginnings of of visuality, just trying to 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 look at that problem. What do you think? Uh, looking back now a little bit, do, do do you think that worked? Like solving that goal, like not not like if the company did well or anything, like no, specifically yeah. that goal. Do you think it it? Yeah, so this is actually really hard. It's, it's just coming out of the you know, last week we were having um, uh, I'm sure we'll talk about our our conference and mm -hmm. and that actually I uh, used you know to reflect a lot of this like looking you know, a year behind like are we doing progress on these things and same goes to climate change and so on. We, we, we can talk about that, but in the case of biodiversity, the general answer is a very clear no. I mean like we are now uh, you know like species are disappearing at the highest at the highest rate ever. I mean, like, it is considered that, you know, like, more than 40% of, you know, like, populations of, you know, like, I think, like, there's even studies that more than 50% of bird populations are gone. And if you look at, you know, like, uh, in the insects and different kind of, like, entire groups, I mean, like, it, there is a massive uh, extinction going on, and we have not stopped it. And in a way, if you look back, I mean, like, one of the ways that we thought about, like, bridging the gap between between science and policy making, we, we thought like, maybe it's just not visible enough. So, you know, like, I was also very inspired by, you know, remember the uh, uh, the Al Gore movie around the inconvenient truth, right, on climate change. So it was for the first time, the first documentary that in a way was like, okay, well, this is actually really making it visible, making visible the issue. You know, like, you cannot deny it, or you're in a way, I mean, like, this idea of, you know, like, we, we have to, uh, yeah, we have to educate, you know, policy and, and the general public around it. And I think after all these years of advocate, of showing, you know, like data stories, showcasing, you know, the declines, showcasing the impacts of climate change and so on, I, I, I mean, I think we have to be honest to ourselves and it hasn't worked. It has not worked. We've, uh, I think now we've shown in so many different ways, you know, the biodiversity decline in the impacts of climate change. I like it. It is hard to not believe that. You, I mean, people are really fully aware of it and still it's going at an incredible pace. So awareness, it's clearly not enough to call like resolve the issue. Um, and you know, like that was in a way we were naive. We thought like if people will see what was happening, they will stop. And the answer to that right now, I, I think we were, it wasn't right. I, I don't think, you know, like it has worked. Has it, has it helped? Certainly hope, but it has it really fixed the issues. I mean, by no means. I mean, we knew that it was not going to be enough, but I think you know we we had much higher hopes on the power of data visualization for bringing awareness to a topic and and the and the outputs that this would produce than it actually turned out to be the actual real impact. What do you think? Uh, so kind of dive into that a little bit more. What do you think is needed? Well, what we need is definitely people to act, right? I mean, like, you know, on climate change, on biodiversity, on sustainability, and all those topics. That's very clear. People to act, and organizations to act, and governments to act. And I'm not, uh, this is very clear, right? I mean, like, we, we go in at the pace, and, you know, in terms of, you know, like, uh, uh, the way that we're, like, reducing emissions, that is clearly not enough. Uh, it's I mean it's, it's all the obvious things that we all know. Yeah. So so the uh, so no, I'm not gonna go here into a full speech around it, but you know like I think you're know, like awareness again is definitely not not happening. I think you're know, like this concept of you know we have to. I mean we're now in a, in in a way we're no longer kind of like you know looking at you know how we stop this. It, we we are already in full let's adapt to what is happening. I mean, like I was I was describing, I was really in a way annoyed this year at doing in our conference, at the Spatial Citizens Conference. I always start the conference talking about climate change and the impacts, you know, and how it's important, how geographers have a very, very important role, you know, to um, to help on this, on, on what is happening and understanding and, and adapting and so on. And I've been, you know, for many years, you know, like showcasing your know, awareness around, you know, like how ge uh, geography can help to understand climate change and these topics. But this year, actually what we were talking was all around adaptation. We're not talking about like how do we stop it. We're talking about you know like how do you prepare for the floodings? How do you prepare for the fires? How do you prepare for the heat uh, for the heat waves? 
on the public sector, I mean, like with the, I mean, this year, I mean, I mean, we are on record, you know, to get the hottest uh, year in, in history, but uh, also the the record on heat waves, the record on fires, the records of flooding all around the world. And, and yeah, now, I mean, like clearly, I mean, the public are, uh, I mean, uh, governments are, are realizing and, and are quickly trying to adapt their emergency response and, and all these things. Uh, but so are, you know, like the private sector. Uh, I was very impressed. I mean, like, you know, like uh, bottling companies having to change their, their logistics to prepare for a much faster turnout of heat waves to ensure that they have, you know, like inventory where they need it at the times, right? So... So it was very sad to see that, you know, we've moved from how do we stop this to how do we now adapt? Uh, it is what we have to do. I mean, climate change and, you know, and biodiversity loss are here already. Uh, no, no question around it, but it's, uh, uh, it is, it's been very, um, uh, it's, it's been very frustrating over the years to see this shift, you know, from going like, hey, hey, we, hey, this is coming, this is coming, this is coming. Okay, now this is going to get worse. It's going to get worse. So, uh, yeah. When uh, I hear a lot about the the conversation like this, there's it, it very turns into very quickly turns into this is such a huge monumental problem that like it paralyzes a lot of people in terms of like what can we do? Um, and so you know, kind of looking at what we talked about before, I'm I'm curious how have you personally decided what to work on, what to focus on? Because you, you can't solve everything. You have yeah. to be focused to have an impact. You have to say, this is the thing I'm going to work on and all the other problems in the world, I'm not going to tackle them. Yeah. How have you, you know, moving forward over the, the, the past few years and, and just now, how do you decide what to work on and what is the thing that you're going to to spend mm -hmm. your time on yeah so uh, from my uh, from my side and i think you know maybe it can also be generalized I, I think like we are all going to need to work on the things that we're better at so in a sense i mean like i my my personal opinion on this is like you know like javier where, where what is the thing that you do well that you know like we you can apply you know towards these issues right so uh so that's how i call i look at it i mean like it probably it wouldn't you know like help much that you know if i decide you know to move into politics and try to because <laughs> i'm probably not the best at that i mean okay. no, don't tell me wrong there's other people that should do that it's just that probably it's not me so i mean i'm good at you know like data i'm good you know like at you know like at, at, at kind of like analytics and you know how we apply analytics and sustain analytics towards this. I mean, of course, we all have our rep our responsibility around awareness and ensure that, you know, we bring, you know, like science and these topics to everyone. But it might say, for example, I'm a, a few years ago, I started, you know, working on a foundation too called Tierra, Tierra Pura. And in this foundation, one of the things that we are doing is using nature-based solutions towards, you know, climate change. And it's a pretty controversial topic, uh, right? It's, it's really uh, reforestation, you know, like the answer to climate change. And and uh, it's definitely not on its own. It's going to be always one part of a much bigger thing as well. But I'm actually quite... Um, quite uh, proud of you know the work that we're doing now around we we are doing we're developing projects where we are reforesting you know we're doing restorations of ecosystems in Spain but also for example in Costa Rica we're restoring mangroves and we are trying to use those restorations to capture carbon that we that we certify and that we can use to sell carbon credits for companies that are looking to go towards net zero. And this, this is, can be a really, a really complex thing, right? Because the net zero can like be a, a double sword car like issue, right? I mean, like in my, from my point of view, the thing that I'm most excited about, uh, it's on one side, what we're doing is where every time that we work with a company before we actually can access, you know, to any of our credits, we ask them to see their uh, reduction projects, their reduction projects. So how do they reduce you know, their, their carbon. And I think, you know, like if I can accelerate, you know, the transition of some of these companies to put in place faster, a reduction program, that's carbon is not going to go into the atmosphere. So, so, and that is something where I can actually act. And if I look at that and I manage to accelerate, I don't know, a hundred companies into call, I decides to go net zero, you know, like do a reduction program two years before they were, they were end up going to do it. I mean, that's a lot of carbon that we're saving on the atmosphere. So that's one. Um, at the same time, using 
uh, restoration projects uh, using nature-based solutions, for me, it's very, very important because, again, it's climate change, but it's biodiversity. It's ecosystem loss. More, not only biodiversity, it's really ecosystems. You know, like we're destroying ecosystems like crazy, and those ecosystems is what sustain. You know, I mean, also all the species, including humans, but it's also probably what is going to make us more resilient in climate change scenarios. So, I mean, like I can tell you, like Spain with more trees is going to be more resilient than Spain with less trees. So, it's as simple as that. And if you know, like, uh, and I, I myself, I try to say, like, hey, look, let's not get stopped. And I get into a lot of arguments with people who say, like, why are you doing this? I mean, like, trees, you know, like, then they get burned and then all the carbon is uh, released. Or, you know, like, uh, this is really, in, uh, you just call, like, uh, greenwashing, you know, companies who are doing, you know, like, net zero. And y you can be a stall by all of that. But right now, this is the best way that I think to actually have an impact to potentially reduce the amount of carbon that goes into atmosphere and at the same time do something around restoration that I think it is it is fundamentally good for everybody. So that that's my feeling. Just look at you know the things that you do well. Look how you could connect that towards the issue and work on those topics. That's if we all do a little bit of that in that direction, if we all push in that direction, hopefully, you know, we will we will we'll get better. Right. And so that, that that's a foundation that you have uh, and that, that you work on, on on the side, right? It's not mm -hmm. the main. You're, you're still mostly focused on your role at Carto. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah. But it's just like I, of course, I mean, we, um, and, you know, like this, this topic is very, very, uh, very important to me. So, I mean, like, it's definitely, you know, like a, a side thing that I, I apply. And those two things are connected. So the usage of, you know, geospatial technology is pretty important, for example, for monitoring those forests in terms of, you know, like uh, uh, measuring the amount of carbon that is captured. So I, I truly believe that this is, there's never been a more important area for a geographer to be alive. Right. The number of, you know, like challenges that we have as a society that are in a way going to require hardcore geography understanding at the core of it is, I mean, all of them, right? I mean, like it's never we've had so many global challenges like this that will only be possible to be tackled with, you know, like information systems that allow us to you know to monitor this. So I'm, so I'm, I'm obviously, I mean, I think you know it's part of our responsibility, honestly, as geographers, you know, to the same as you know, with a scientist working on taxonomy to work on biodiversity laws. It is, it is our responsibility if you work on geography to look at how you can apply these, these your skills on these topics. Can you tell me a little bit more about the work that you've done at Carto? Because you also founded. Uh, Carto, and yeah. so I'm I'm curious if you could you know kind of the same question that I asked about you, uh, the same you know how would you describe or how you probably have to do that a lot. How do you describe what Carto does? Sure. So uh, so at Carto, our goal really is to is to enable um, organizations and users to leverage the power of spatial analytics. That's really, we you know, like at the core of it, our fundamental mission is to democratize access to spatial analytics. Um, for you and I, and you know, and everybody in our sector, we are all very, uh, of course, passionate about you know the power of you know like how geography and spatial analysis can be used to pretty much you know like help on any in any place. But the reality is, if you look at it, is that most people do not have a a geographic way of, you know, like thinking about problems. They didn't know how actually a space analysis can help them. And in partly thing, you know, it's because of, uh, of you know, the, the available uh, platforms and available tools. So what we're trying to do with Carto is really is to, is to make this type of analytics accessible to a much wider audience. Um, and that's how we started. I mean, um, looking back at, you know, like when, when so Carto is a spin-off from Visuality. So what happened is that, you know, like when we were working on Visuality, uh, we ended up having to do a lot of projects where we had to process a lot of spatial data, obviously on, on environmental, you know, like location is a very, very fundamental call, like uh, as I mentioned. So we were doing a lot of analysis around uh, around uh, maps and handling very large amounts of data. And the quality tools, the open source and the and the commercial tools that were available to do that were very limited to handle this amount of data. Like at the time, now looking back, I mean like uh, the first project remember was was working was with the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. That project had around at the time 250 million records, 250 million points of a species. And 
And at the time, you know, like making a map of just 250 million points was just really, really hard. So we ended up, you know, like saying like, how can we actually do this? So we ended up creating a framework to actually make these type of maps. And at that point we said like, well, look, if we need, you know, to have a framework to do these type of maps, I bet there's many other people that actually have these, uh, the same issues. And that was kind of like the typical kind of like story of, you know, like then we started working on a framework and then at some point that framework grew and we thought like, why don't we spin that into an, its own product? And and that was the origins of Carto. And uh, the, the vision again um, was to multiple like this democratization, I was saying like, but even more naive, you know, like, uh, well, not naive because it really is happening. But the, the idea that um, if we want to serve these environmental projects that we're working on, we better be sure that we provide them with the best technology that exists. And the only best way to make the best technology for them would be to be to make a commercial product that will actually you know, be successful on the marketplace. So there was this connection of, in order to provide like good tools, they have to be commercially viable. And, and in a way that was, that was also like uh, the arena of it. Like we wanted to increase the impact from working from projects to uh, in the consultancy side to work, you know, like in a product that could potentially call like change the way that spatial analytics was done by many, many people. So right. that's in a way the fundamental call like uh, thesis in here is if we make spatial analytics more accessible, you know, like we could potentially make a more data driven, better optimized, better working society. There's a lot to I want to unpack here. The, I want to start with the last thing that you said here is about having good tools is making them commercially viable. I think there's a this kind of duality in a lot of software between these proprietary tools that you can buy and open source. Right. And so I'm I'm really curious if you could explain a little bit more what do you mean about like why is the commercial viability needed in your opinion to have good tools. I, I want to make sure I understand. I, I feel like there's more here and no, I want to dig a, a bit more into it. Yeah. So um, I, I can actually go like, uh, put, I'm not going to name a specific project because you know, like, I don't think it would be happy with probably, but, you know, like, <laughs> but in, in a way, I mean, like if you, I, the way that we saw that, uh, we, we saw that ourselves, you know, like, right. you know, like in the climate change color, like, or you're like on biodiversity in the, in the conservation color world, there's very often, you know, where you get like companies that offer the software for free, uh, you know, like, or, uh, you know, to, to these organizations. And either the software is really pre-baked or you're, or they are really using them for research. And it was very annoying to me in a way, you know, like, because it felt like we ended up, you know, just testing, you know, the products from commercial products in a way and uh, we were never the actual user the user was someone else and we would just call like a, a way to be testing them and so on so so that that really kind of was frustrating to me that you know like the in order to do biodiversity or you know to make you know good geospatial analysis or spatial analytics you know like you you either were you know like on the you didn't have that that many options and and yeah and then you will get like google microsoft all the big guys will say like let me help you on this problem and then they will you know like put that research program and then it will die and then we will like, okay what do we right. do now so so for me it was like no we, we're not gonna make you know like a product that is open source and people can use just so to find out that you know we're not viable and then we die two days, two years later, and the product is gone, and then who's going to continue the product? And we saw that also on pro, um, on software being done on the research well. There was an, there's a quite a num amount of, you know, like software made by, by scientists on the process of they do the work, and then they release it for free just to two years later. I mean, like, they change jobs, you know, like the career is just right. not going to the research, and now it's abandoned. So... So for me, it was like, no, no, if we want to make this, you know, really good, you know, software takes time. It's going to take, you know, like a number of years for it to get really good, for people to train, bet, you know, like, and actually kind of like extract the potential of it. So we, we cannot make this out of, you know, like funding this through other projects, through research grants and so on. No, it has to actually be a winning product. People want to have, we need to make people want to pay for it. So to it to be sustainable, so that we can warranty. And I actually call, I tell that to a lot of um, uh, projects. I say like, be careful with free products that are you know funded through research projects, through grants, through things like that, because 
that might not last very long and you might be in a worse position. It's better to bet yourself on commercially vi viable products because there's actually you know, going to be a sustainability up, uh, part of it. I'm not saying that you know, commercial is the only way, but definitely you know, sustain sustainable models are a fundamental part of this. I wouldn't want to do a, pro a product that you know, like I offer for free, but I can only offer for three years. Because then I think we might end up you know, leaving people in a worse uh, scenario than we, that we started with. So I think you know, sustainability in the form of you know, like uh, uh, financial sustainability, it is a responsibility of any project that you know, is going to deliver a product and the people are going to invest on. I see. So if I understand correctly, what I'm hearing is you, you, you have a long-term vision on this. Like you're not doing this for right now. You want to build something that lasts. And so the best way to do that is to build something that is durable. And the way to assure that durability is making sure that it is financially independent. It is financially sustainable that today people pay for the thing that they're using. That means that you can just keep on making it. It's very easy. There's this financial incentives to keep on making it yep. because yeah. Okay. And a lot yeah. of uh, open source software, I mean, there's a whole, it's a whole other uh, So the open point, source, but, you know, the open source might be a different color than Mansus in a way, right? No, 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 I, I mean, see. But like, I, I, I'm not really trying to put them against each other. I'm just trying no. to understand where you're coming from. And that, that makes a lot of sense, by the way. And I, I think I share a lot of those uh, opinions on trying to make things that are sustainable and and paying for the things that you use and appreciate means that they're a lot more likely to stick around. Yeah, yeah. there's another thing you know which is around um, I think living by these constraints of you know like having to call like, dedicate yourself to the customers and you're know, like there is there is something around also like being constrained towards, you know, like, what is the, uh, uh, you have to make a real company out of this that also helps you to 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 work better. If it wouldn't be for these constraints, if we were, if we didn't care, if, you know, if we were making money, if, you know, so on, I don't think we will have been, you know, like, so sharp, uh, you know, we will have been able to really kind of, like, make a dent on the, on this industry. So I, I think there's also a very, a very good model in the form of, you know, like, making a successful company is also a very fast way of succeeding on a vision. So right. if you want to make, you know, like really democratize, I mean, like having the path of like, I'm going to make a, a successful company, I think helps a lot. It puts, it puts a lot of, you know, the framework about how you make it happen. Plus it also allows you to align more people that might not be incentivized as you are so much on this, but they might be incentivized on the success of, you know, like of the business. Right. So, like it or not, I mean, like the 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 kind of like the model of you know like making a, a successful business, it has it comes with a lot of you know like uh, um, you know like things around that you know will help you to succeed. Yeah, that that I think that makes sense. You you uh you raised some. This is not a bootstrap company, if I understood correctly. No, it was at the beginning, so it was bootstrap. Yeah. You know, from from the from the consulting, I was saying, but uh, but yeah, I mean, like there was a point. I mean, and looking back at, you know, where we uh, we were almost, you know, like, I think it was like, uh, at some point there were like five people working on the consulting firm and, you know, they were financing something like 15 or 20 people. It was like, woof, this is not going to be sustained for itself. Uh, reality these days is like, you know, like making software is, is pretty expensive. Um, and so at that point we decided, you know, like, hey, uh, you know, we could definitely use some investment, you know, to, to you know, alleviate, right. you know, like the restrictions and so on. So, yeah, so we've raised, uh, yeah, we, we've raised multiple rounds starting you know like from uh, a seed round in Spain all the way to our last day, latest investor in, in New York. How many people is the company now? So we're roughly around 200. Right. The, the reason I ask is because you, you said something early on and I, I would love to know what you think. You, you said that you were frustrated when you were a researcher of like doing all the grants and the applications and the, the paperwork and not doing the actual work. But as you start having a company, especially when there's 200 people, you probably end up doing a lot of, you know, fundraising and uh, hiring and stuff like that and, and not the, the actual work. And so I'm curious, like, 
is that any different in any ways? <laughs> it's a bit of a cheeky question as well, but I no, no, no. Felt but, like but I it, had to ask. <laughs> no, but it, but it's definitely is a good question. Yeah, and it is actually true. I mean, like making a company, it's definitely. I mean, it's not fun all the time. That's for mm -hmm. sure what you can imagine. So, so yeah. So there is. I mean, in my case, I, I mean, I would say like it was a little bit of a trap in a way. I mean, like. I kind of like I saw like okay we think we might have a potential to have like a wider a bigger impact and then well I will I'm willing to call kind of a sacrifice and do these things that I don't like so much you know in order to uh, uh, but I, I mean now, now looking back I think you know like a company or you know like a project and working with others it is also an incredible way of uh, accelerating yourself I, I like a lot um, I mean the place where I where I'm most happy and more excited is, you know, it's in front of a white room with some talented, talented people, you know, working together with me. And, um, and you know, where we are like brainstorming or you're like, and, and, and then you have this acceleration of ideas where you feel like you're combining one into the other and you, and you look back and say like, wow, I would never have able to get to this on my own. Uh, you're like, wow, this is, I feel like I'm part of it because I kind of like design part of it, but you're like, this is better than me. And when you have that feeling of, you're like, wow, this is making me a smarter in a way because I'm collaborating with others, it's very, it's very addictive. And this is, you know, in a way, you know, what companies gives you. Um, I mean, like then, of course, there's all the paces around, you know, like fundraising and so on. With that being said, I mean, like if, if you're a curious person, I mean, like fundraising and all these things are also, you know, like some things that are interesting to learn. I mean, don't mm -hmm. take me wrong. I mean, not so much, you know, learning, you know, like the tax uh, <laughs> repercussions of having <laughs> companies in multiple countries. That's definitely yeah. stuff that I wish I wouldn't learn about. But, um, but you know, like, but you, you learn. To a sense of like, but you know, like on a, on a, I mean, you have to grow, grow up then also and see, you know, what is the compromises of how much, what is the percentage of fun versus the percentage of not fun. And this is an important part that I think you have to also evaluate. I am right now also as we, as then you come through a phase of, you know, like you have to do everything where now, I mean, like you, um, I mean, now I'm, I actually, I'm quite happy because I kind of spend quite a bit of time on doing, you know, like on working with a product, you know, like doing my right. own analysis as I prepare, you know, like I did, like I said, like last week I did the keynote on, on our conference and I did showcase two analysis and I actually uh, developed most of it. So, um, so that's fun. Um, and, and this is, you know, like the, the way that you, you have to, to look at it, right? I mean, like it's never going to be a hundred percent fun. It has to be a significant percentage of fun. Um, but you also have to evaluate uh, the things that you wouldn't get if you wouldn't do it. Like, for example, working with your colleagues and accelerating your output, you know, like, you know, beyond, you know, what you could do on your own. That's, that's really important. I like this idea of thinking about what percentage of fun versus not fun there is in your life and in your day. It's very simple, but I like it even more like that. It's, I, I'm going to... Uh, keep that in mind. It's pretty good. No, it's uh, definitely. You you need to call kind of like I mean, if it works for you, I mean, but I, I mean, yeah, other absolutely. people Other people are very kind of like guided by a. I have a plan, but I I, I can yeah. get simpler. So then you mentioned the conference, and I I want to. This is one of the things I wanted to talk about is because you guys are also organizing. A, a pretty big recurring conference. It's not like a one thing. It seems like it's a yearly thing. So the the spatial data science conference. Um, and I I'm, I mostly have one question, which is why? Because <laughs> um, organizing a conference is an enormous amount of work, and it's pretty orthogonal. If we look at the skill set of what does it take to build a software company and what does it take to run a successful conference, th those skills don't overlap, uh, at least at first sight to me, they don't seem like they overlap that much. So it looks like it's spreading out the area of skills that now you need your company to have and rather than concentrating everything and focusing. So why? <laughs> well, of course I have to say because it's fun, all right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's a great answer. <laughs> 
I mean, and, and definitely it is fun. I right. mean, don't tell me wrong. If it wouldn't be fun, I don't think we would have been able to call like, keep doing it, you know, for so long. It is. Uh, why is it fun? I mean, it's not fun, you know, having to call like, do all the organizations. So but but the conference itself, the Space Elections Conference, we do it now twice a year, one in London and one in New York. When you're there, I mean, the, the energy of the people, you know, the meeting, you know, like, passionate people like you around geography and discussing, you know, like tools, technologies, you know, like new uh, ideas, new use cases, new analysis. It, it is really, really good. I think, you know, like we really need this type of, you know, like a community gathering together. It, it, in a way, I mean, like this week, I'm like incredible, incredibly, you know, like pump, you know, from from the, the meeting last week. And so, so that's definitely very important. Uh, now, uh, personally, from a kind of like company perspective, to your point, um, yes, it definitely is a big risk, you know, to to take into a challenge like this. But but it it boils down towards you know like, uh, are you are you this for the long run or not? And if you're for the long run, I mean, like a company like Carto, a software in a way, I mean, I cannot live without a community. And if you're really serious about building a community, you're gonna build an event. You're gonna uh, you're gonna have to create your 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 industry. You're gonna have to create your category, in a way. And in our case, I mean, the category is spatial data science, right? And and there's a number of people, and we are actually kind of getting more and more people interested in the way that we think about geography and how to do a spatial analysis. And uh, and that event allows you that. There's obviously then a lot of um, and what is what is this you know like uh, uh, important because. The community at the end of this is what is going to drive you in the long way. And this is, you know, like the people that you're going to move careers, but they're going to keep using your product no matter where they go. And we've seen that already. People that have changed like two, three times careers, and every time they move to a new job, they bring your cartel with them. So from a business perspective, it makes sense as a way to um, to call ideal, build this uh this uh, this relation with, with your users. So that's number one. Then there's obviously, I mean, like uh, uh, the benefits that comes. The most obvious is from a sales perspective. Um, I mean, I like will use the uh, op- the the the, uh, like the conference to accelerate the uh, the re- the opportunities and you know and the the relations that we're establishing with new business. So uh, for those you know like are evaluating Carto and you know they want to learn more about it, we invite them to the conference. They get to learn more about it. You know about you know how people are using it. So that's that helps a lot also on that direction for existing customers. Likewise, I mean they get to learn more about you know how to use the product, the new innovation you know what it's coming so 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 it helped all the different angles now it only probably makes sense if you're at a certain scale and we are already at a certain scale that it makes sense for us when you're like very small i mean it will be hard you know to to start it uh to to, to kind of like a start conference like that but for us i mean uh, there's also all the other benefits around for example now we we drive our um, product development to align it in terms of announcements towards those conferences too, right? So it, it provides cadence. It provides, you know, like a way to do that. So so it's a lot of, you know, like benefits that comes on. And and the answer, you know, is like any kind of like company that is big enough will end up, you know, creating a conference if they really want to take care of their community and, and then they will use it for all these other things. So if you ask me now, we do it because it's fun. Uh, because it bas- it makes business case it makes business sense. I see. So why not do that online? Why not um, like not not just a conference? But the first thing that comes to mind is you're you're building software that scales on the internet. It, it scales like people are online everywhere. And so why do that as a as a physical event that is tied to one place in time and and one physical place i mean you said there's there's two but you, you, you get my point compared to no, uh to, to trying to, to spread that over uh having a presence online and building a community online of course uh, well those two things are not exclusive that's fair so uh <laughs> so you that's number one and i think we still have a long way to do on building our community online we have like a Typical kind of like a Slack, and you know we have a, a few ways to call it enable it, and we're probably going to need to invest more on it. Uh, we actually did try running these events uh, online, obviously during the pandemic, and we ran them online. Yeah. So, uh, and the numbers were much by, bigger. We got like thousands and thousands of people registering, so so it was quite successful like that. Uh, um, 
But at the end of the day, you know, when we uh, when we evaluated after two years doing it online, was like we were missing, you know, the actual call, like you know, like physical contact with people. So mm. what we actually thought about it was like, well, let's keep and everything that we do in the conference then becomes available online. All our talks, all the workshops, you don't have to come to the conference to consume the content. That's always online, and it will always be free. That's number one. So you you and and you use that a lot, you know, to to train people to so 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 those things you know like one works with the other. The other thing that we are doing, as you see, we do now one in US and one in Europe. So the idea is to, to avoid people having to travel that much. I mean, for first of all, sustainability reasons as well, but accessibility reasons too, right? So uh, so we we think you know we can get you know to a richer audience, uh, to a bigger audience, you know, by by splitting it. And in fact, actually, we're starting now. One part of the conference, which is around workshops, we're doing in now uh, what we call like special design boot camps, which we're doing in multiple cities, and those are like smaller events, like something between fifty to hundred people, just focus on learning certain things, and that that help us to scale things up. I, in the long term, if you ask me, it's going to be a mix. There's always going to be, you know, like uh, um, you know this this presence where you're going to be in person, and then there's going to be like uh, the online part of it, and. I think you know, like we uh, uh, we're trying to always to be that get that balance. If you ask me, probably events will be mostly attended by people local to where the event is, and uh, and but you know promote it worldwide. So in a way, what we want to see is you know, we, we don't want to see like the entire world moving traveling to a place for a week conference. What we want to see is, you know, it's like the event probably going where the people I are, see. and you know, I like this and that. So, but and always, you know, like mixing it, you know, with the with the online uh, community as so one. There's a lot of you know, like ways that you can organize this, but uh, and we still obviously, you know, like figuring out what is the best uh, pace. And I can say this year we have like like boot camps probably in. 10, 15 cities, and then the conference. It's a lot of work for the marketing team. Yes. On on that note, like I. I did listen to a few of, of some of your talks, and um, I think one of the most recent ones that you've done is about uh, kind of bringing in together geospatial and AI. And I know it's a thing that you've been quite interested in, quite on top of a lot. Um, and so this past year has been kind of explosive in terms of everything AI from large language models to generative AI. And so I want to shift gears a little bit here and and talk about that a little bit. I'm curious if if we just, you know, if I just prompt you to talk about geospatial and AI, what what are some of the things that come to mind? So, we've been experimenting too with a number of things, but um from our own experimentations what we've seen also being done by others, uh, uh, first of all, it's excitement. There's a lot of exciting things that you could be looking at. From my point of view, the, the, the part that I'm most excited right now from what we've actually tested and what we've seen on the on the field already is this concept of what we're calling the conversational maps or conversational GIS. I mean, I think we call it now conversational maps uh, commercially, but essentially it's this idea of like talking to the map. So if you see the typical GIS, imagine the typical GIS interface of, you know, like a map, and a sidebar with filters, widgets, and things like that, you know, that where you can access multiple layers of information, that you can perform analysis. Most people think that everybody understands this or understands can actually read a map. But if you look at the actual statistics about the usage of these apps, I mean, the, the amount of, you know, like little usage that they find, I mean, like most people get to one of those applications and they might zoom to the house or they might zoom into an area, but they're not going to use all these apps as much as you think that, you know, like you will be doing, they will be when you're using them. Or when you make a map, you, they're not going to spend like 15 minutes, you know, like panning around, looking at, you know, like the correlations on the map and looking at the little, we do, but not everybody does. <laughs> um now, what we've done actually on these things, and we, we saw a case in our last uh, last week conference, we, we saw a demo where we actually put a, a an, an AI agent on it that is trained on the content on the maps, the possibilities of the maps in terms of widgets and you know like what you can do, filter and so on, and can understand what is being displayed on the map. And if you look the conversations that you can have with uh, with that AI agent around the map are, are are really amazing, are really remarkable. So you can you know like say like, hey, I'm looking. You can express your intention, and the AI can tell you like, hey, yeah, maybe you want to look at this part of the map. Maybe you want to look at this. You know, like check out this. It's in a way kind of like it is if 
it's in a way if you have like a, a professional geographer by your side explaining to you the map. Like, hey, you see this map? This is a map of wildfires. Well, I say, oh, yeah, what, what is what is important around it? Well, this year, you see there's a lot of these areas. And, you know, like it's really we're seeing this trend. And uh, what about my area? Well, in your area, this is what we are like seeing. Can you see this and that? You know, like having, you know, that person that explains you the map and you know, and explains you and, and can help you to guide, you know, how to use a GIS or, you know, like an information system around filtering, performing analysis for you in natural language, I think... Uh, from my point of view, it could be one of the most disruptive things that we've seen on geography for a long time. Because it's going to mean really accessibility to a much wider audience of users. Uh, it is hard to believe that, you know, we can make like a complex H3 spatial analysis, you know, mixing, you know, like 10 layers and creating a score index, put it on a map and expect people to say like, oh, okay, yeah, I get it. <laughs> it's, it is not the way it's going to be. And yes, of course, we can go and say like, hey, this is what the maps tells you. But the beauty and the power of maps is the possibility to explore them yourself, to actually kind of make them your own, to make it into your own experience. And this is only possible if you can understand the map, if you can understand the data model behind it, if you can understand what geography, what a spatial analysis allows you to do when looking at a map like this, and this is something we're going to accelerate tremendously with AI. So to me, that's definitely number one. We have a, a, a many other uh, things where we are applying it and we'll see incredible success. But that one alone, I think is going to be mind-blowing. Yeah, there's this, uh, there's this tweet that I just keep thinking about from uh, Andre Karpthay, which is the, he was the, um, uh, well, he's done many things, but he was leading the uh, Tesla AI team for until last year, I think, and now is at OpenAI. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase this tweet, but it was basically English is the ultimate programming language. Uh, that basically he was saying, yeah, well, the underlying idea is that all of the programming languages that we have, SQL, Python, whatever are kind of tools that we have today to ask a lot of questions. And, and I know in one of the talks you did, you showed, for example, querying OSM, like writing, a, asking, I think it was ChatGPT, to just query OpenStreetMap for exactly what you wanted without ever touching SQL. And so it just yeah. gives you the, the SQL commands, like here's all the things that you need to do. And then you can, I think what you guys did was you go even a layer before and you like go all the way to making a visualization with just a, a prompt, which is basically you remove the, the GIS or the data scientist in, in the middle and you just go from, here's all the question I want to answer and it just pops it up on a map. Yeah. Yes. I mean, like, can I actually say my screen? Uh, well, most people are only listening to this, so, so you're, I'm going to ask you to describe it instead, <laughs> and we'll put a link in the in the show notes. If it if it's something that you can send it to me, yeah, 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 I'll put a link in the show notes, and people can go have a look. Happy, uh, but happy. You, we're going to stick to audio mostly. <laughs> okay, so uh, so yes, so we uh, this is a very interesting thing, right? And it's it's kind of like if you've experimented with prompt engineering and you're like programming with uh, with AI, it, it's crazy because you're like you are essentially kind of like programming in English, how you say like, or yeah. in any language, right? It's, it's, it's so much fun. So uh, so in the in the uh, conference in London, I showcased how to generate uh, labels for uh, scoring indexes. So, you know, like this type of analysis where you call kind of like looking at many different factors, you call kind of like uh, prioritize doing, in this case, planting trees in a city to, uh, to, to reduce uh, um, heat waves. So that was kind of like in the, the case that I was doing there. So essentially what you're looking at is like, if you're like far away from a, from a, um, from a park or, and you are in an area that is very highly population dense and it's actually the demographics like, uh, you know, like older uh, people, those are going to be like areas that are more vulnerable and the potential you want to prioritize in terms of do acting on this topic, right? Now, how do you get, you know, to this scoring of, you know, like of a place? Um, you know, like that is, uh, that, that it can be quite a lot of mathematics around it. It can be a very complex formula. So if you can like say like, Hey, your place is now, you know, like in 0 0.85, you know, like a scoring, you know, towards your this prioritization, that's totally meaningless to anybody. And you say, Oh yeah, it's because, you know, like you score this because, you know, like, look, we mix all this, they will not get it. 
So actually asking AI to make you labels to describe why a place is good for something based on the formula and so on, I found it like work. We, we did the demo on that. That was pretty impressive. On the so, open street. Yep. No, I was just going to interrupt you here, like just to make sure I understand. So you have a you have a point with a bunch of features, and those features are indexes from zero to one. Yes. Um, and so instead of saying, oh, on um, I don't know greenness, it has a score of 0.8. You ask it to write what that actually means, which is like, oh, there's probably a lot of trees around this place, or rather even, than showing the value. Yes, and even or even more. Right. I mean, like this is the thing, right? I mean, like the uh, score index at the end is going to be a value from zero to one about how much you should do something there. But how do you get to that value? It's a combination of all these other values. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, you know, like the re the place is prioritized because it's really far away from any trees. That's really, really, it, it performs really bad. But in other cases, it might be because it's very, very vulnerable. The people living there are very, very, very vulnerable. So how do you get to the index depends on the result of the how you've score, how you calculated your score. Now, if you give to in the prompt engineers, you give to the uh, to the AI, like, hey, I have this index that is made of all these variables. And in this particular location, these are actually the values, and therefore this is the score index. Tell, explain me why. You know, like explain me the result of this score index for this location, and it will go and say, like, yeah, this is a priority number one because of this and that and that. Versus before, you will have something like this is priority number one. Why? Well, because the formula tells you. Now I can tell you, like, because it has this, this, and that and that. And if you if you only have like four classes, that will be fine. But if you have like in these cases, in we're so case in your life where you have like more than uh, five thousand locations, then you're like you're not gonna be able to write meaningful kind of like explanations about the result of the index for each of these cases. But the AI can do it for you. So that's a pretty. That was one of the things that really uh, we we like a lot. Now on the on the area around accessibility of data, you'd say we did a demo essentially that's so case. Um, like uh, yeah, you. You tell me, uh, if you look at the OpenStreetMap uh, data model, it sounds like simple. It's just like you have like uh, essentially a waste, you have like a, a vertices. I mean, you, it's a very simple call, like uh, n not normalized data model. But if you actually call, like, try to query that model, it's pretty hard because you need to know the tags, you need to know quite a bit of things. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so what we do essentially on this demo was to like looking. I'm looking for you know like uh, uh, health facilities, and it will know you know which tags to use, and it will help you to write the SQL. So then you can just run that automatically. So that actually brings me to to a different way of looking at it. So you said like English is the is the, or he was saying like English is the is the language for programming. I would say like SQL is the language for uh, analytics. If you think about it, you know, like the a SQL is the is the connection that makes AI systems know how to query data models in databases. It is that intermediate call like language that you can like AIs are pretty good at doing SQL. So if you have well documented your data warehouse, your data models, your database, um, and you train the AI model on that, then the AI model will be able to call and make SQL to access the information that it needs to extract the information. So we're going to see that more and more. What we're going to see is, you know, like organizations that, you know, have to keep doing their data models, organizing the information in the most proper way inside their database or data warehouse in their GIS system in a way. But then describing with metadata better so that the AI model can understand it and then knows how to access it. And the way that it will access it is SQL. So... Uh, that is very, very, very powerful because it means that we can continue using the same tools that we're doing. But now, I mean, like, you're not going to have to predefine every potential call like view on your data yeah, yeah. or question because the AI actually knows how to access that. So so I think, you know, that's pretty interesting. And in the, in the uh, latest demo that I showcased last week, um, we did um, a demo where uh, we look at flooding data. And um, what we're looking is like, okay, there's like these uh, emergencies or like these alerts in the United States that are published by the weather, National Weather Service. So now we know that there's an alert in there. But if you look at the alert, it's like text that is like written for humans. Like, hey, yeah, we're expecting this amount of you know, like flooding for this. So we pass that alert to the AI and we say like, search me, extract, you know, what infrastructure do you think that is going to get affected by this alert? and give it to me in the form of a OSM query 
to extract that data from my data from the database. So now I can actually call it move from an alert to infrastructure in OpenStreetMap that might be affected. Mm -hmm. And then I intersect that with a flooding model. And so, so yes, so essentially data integration between systems with AI, in a way you can say like AI is going to replace a lot of the ETL and data integrations. Because if you know, if we describe the data models behind the scenes, AI will be able to call and make these connections between them. And you're going to tell them, you're going to be able to program ETLs or data transformations in natural language of like, give me, using the alerts from the weather service, inter you know, find me your areas that are suitable, you know, like possibly going to get flooded and, you know, which infrastructure will be affected by that. And therefore, which amount of population could potentially be uh, affected uh, by it and which critical facilities, you know, are going to, likely going to be disrupted, uh, disrupting service. And then AI will be able to call a query all these different systems using SQL to extract it and then merge it all together and provide, you know, like information system like that. And that is really my goal. I wonder uh, how long SQL would last in that, in that sense, because I feel like we're slapping something on top of SQL because SQL is what we already have to query a lot of databases. But there's there's no reason for us for people to interact with sql like if if all you do like it's the tool that we have today to query the database but there's probably way more efficient tools for large language models to query databases so it feels like sql is kind of this it is it's still sql is like all pranger like most programming languages, they're made for people before machines if they're done well. When you write code, you mostly write code that's going to be read by people and then that's going to be run by machines. Mm -hmm. But if we move away from that, English is like great for people, but it's very messy. There's no variables and stuff like that. And so I just wonder what if we roll the clock a little bit more, like 10 years, and this gets a lot better, what happens to SQL? Do we still need something like that? I, I don't know. No, I mean, it's, it's a fair question. My answer is yes, really big yes. Okay. The way that we use SQL will be different. And don't tell me wrong. The idea of like, you know, the writing SQL that we do now as a Kalaka data analyst will be gone. You, we're not going to be, we're not going to be writing SQL. SQL will be re written by AI Kalaka models. That's for sure. I mean, I, I don't see in 10 years myself writing, you know, tr writing a SQL myself to describe it, you know, like it will be written by an AI. But SQL under the hood to call it transformed, you know, what I meant by, I mean, like we still, we're going to need, you know, like we, I, on one side, I mean, like the AI is very good at understanding your intention, understanding what you want to get, this analysis that I described, and it's very good then into trans translating into another language. And you've seen you know, like how good it is at translating between languages. It's, it's just incredible, right? Um, so SQL is a language. It's a language to talk to data bases. And in that way, you know that AI are going to, and there's already a number of you know, like companies that allows you to automatically translate and you know, like the voice of someone speaking a different language and you speaking a different language and have almost a, a fluent conversation with someone that you don't, and you know, in a different language and that you don't understand and that AI is, is doing that translation in real time. The same is going to happen with databases and data warehouses. At the end of the day, data needs to be model and needs to be architecture and a structure to and be collected in a way that is effective. That is not going anywhere. AI is not going to change that. We're not going to be able just to collect that data randomly and expect to get good value out of it. The idea of like data modeling and how we structure the information will be relevant in 10 years for sure. The way that we access the information then will be different. You know, like, but it, think about like SQL at that AI now speaks English, Spanish, you know, like German, a number of a, open AI it speaks like, I think probably I think it's right now like 20 languages pretty good. SQL is going to be one of them. And SQL is the language to speak to databases. And it will be the way that, you know, like we'll, we'll be able to call like, uh, you will, we will interact with the systems. But still, there will be, you know, people designing, how do we better capture the information? What information we capture? How do we structure it so that it's most accessible? The uh, the relational model and 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 you know the, the way that we've actually call like design systems you know to to ensure that we don't lose the I'm 
first of all, I would just say I'm fascinated by the power of, you know, like uh, SQL and relational databases. Why? Yes, I mean, like the idea that, you know, like if I structure information in a specific way, I, I, I can prove mathematically that I will be able to access all of it in whatever way I want, uh, in whatever question I want to do later, right? The normal model, it is an incredible achievement to ensure that we can feature proof the way that we collect data. So collect the data in this way, and then you know that you will be able to access it the way that you want later, even if you don't know how you want to use it later. That is an incredible achievement in that. So that's going to stay, and then AI will just make it incredibly much easier to use. And yeah, I mean, like it will it will just speak to the systems in an automatic way. So um, yeah, it's, uh, I think you're know, like thinking of SQL as the lingua franca of the, the lingua, the lingua, the, the the, the, yeah, the, the language of uh, of analytics is it really is the way to think about it. SQL will be the thing that allows two products to connect, even if it's controlled by an AI or through ETLs. And it's just going to be essentially the way that we describe data, that we talk about data. I I don't know if I agree with that because uh, I I feel like compared to German or or Spanish, let's say Spanish, I think SQL is uh, inherently tied to a specific technology. And and so I wonder if the underlying technology that is behind that is just going to involve a lot because of how it gets used more mm. than something like Spanish. Is it? I mean, like, is SQL really associated with a, with a, with a technology? Not really. I mean, if you look at it, I mean, we made an analysis of, you know, like the state of SQL. And now SQL is used for machine learning, is used for data processing, is used for pretty much, if you look at the entire car, like analytics car, like a space, SQL is used in all of it now. Mm -hmm. People are using SQL to describe not just this is not the SQL that you know like you used to use to query to query a Postgres to get your data down. No, no, we're talking now. SQL is used for pretty much anything. And in fact, actually, the tendency now is to try to make every process SQL possible. So SQL is used to send emails. SQL is used to call like yeah, like we we uses to to send messages. It's just a language to perform operations on data, and it's no longer associated necessarily with databases. It is right. just a way to, it, it is a, it's a form of model to express intentions and actions on data. And that is way more, that's much better, that is much better precise than any kind of like conversational, conversational language that we have. And, and you need that level of Precision and you know, like and, uh, and preciseness, uh, so computers to actually work effectively. I mean, one thing is you know like that the AI can give you a pretty decent answer, and another one is that I really want all this information, and I yeah. know it's collected. I want it to be precise. There is a there is a one there's answer that is right, and that can be actually proven to be right. So so now I, I mean I'm I don't see I think you most people think of SQL just as this language you know to um, to, to call a query databases, but SQLs are defined, are, are made now to, to understand how you model and structure, and you know, like how do you collect, how do you call, like do operations, how do you space analysis? I mean, like a SQL, it's, it is in a way uh, uh, also, well, it is an analytics uh, language also. It's not only a data access model these days. Look at, you know, like how far you can go with something like post yes to perform a space analysis. You can claim, I mean, like, there's a reason why the majority of the computing platforms these days allows you to perform um, uh, analysis either in Python in a notebook or in SQL notebooks. So that is how good and how large, uh, how expressive SQL is. So what happens, what do you think becomes the skills that are useful in this new post AI world? Because we uh, we basically just erased or made ir irrelevant like all the data analysis uh, analysts nearly like oh we we don't need anybody to write these queries anymore we don't need people to do most of the analysis because we have this model that does it so again not not necessarily today but if we roll the clock like a decade I'm curious what do you think becomes the the skills that are valuable, that people are hiring for, that are looking for, that, that differentiate people? 
<laughs> that's a very tough one, right? So, I mean, I, we, the reality is that we really don't know. I mean, I can say, yeah, prompt engineers. There's going to be like a million prompt engineers. Don't think so, neither. So, um, so, so, it's, so it's hard, right, to predict, right? But I, I think, you know, like, um, I will, what it's clear is that, you know, certain car, like, you... Certain type of like work that we do now around, for example, explaining. I mean, I was just kind of putting this example of like AI can be just like this, this uh, kind of like uh, geographer that helps you understand maps by your site. That you know, like so obviously from a consulting perspective, I mean, there's certain things that you know I like, would probably be gone. So I can tell you that you know, like that. That's how it feels. There's gonna be less work, you know, for people that our translators of, you know, what it something means, because we're probably going to live in a world that, you know, we're going to make sure that whatever we're doing, AI is capable of understanding. And this is how it feels like it's in the way it's happening. <laughs> we're just laughing the other day that uh, there's likely going to be jobs for doing, you know, similar to search engine optimizations, SEO. Oh, there's yeah. probably going to be like, um, you know, like AI engines optimizations so if someone you know asks about carto to uh to chat gpt i wanted you to talk about these things and so on you know, so we're likely gonna be starting seeing things like that but i mean what i mean by that is like we're gonna likely gonna be seeing more that we as part of our work we're gonna be be making sure that whatever we are doing it is accessible to the ai in the way that we want it to be accessible so that you know people leverage it that way so i think you know like we're just going to be likely something so things like data modeling and some of you know like how do we design systems i don't think they're going anywhere i think you know like if something i, I mean I, I can tell you only on the on the medium term you know like we're going to see now a very big demand to make ais uh, you know like uh, to make our systems more ai ready and that is going to be a pretty big transformation over in the next years to come. Uh, as we, then eventually maybe the AIs get you know like so smart on their own that no one has to tell them anything about anything. <laughs> but uh, but I mean that is a future that I, I it's hard for me to call like uh, yeah. distinguish. So um, so I think you know like if, if, in our particular industry, I think you know like the the work of you know whoever is kind of like doing the uh, uh, analysis and using the tools as well is still well well it is a, a very valid. Uh, uh, I don't think you know like data analysts are going are going away. Now I don't think data analysts that all they are doing is <laughs> writing SQL for someone, someone making a question and them answering the SQL. Not likely you know to be very very defensible on the on the long run. So um, yeah, then there's obviously a lot of things that are going to be opening and around you know like science and you know like and and probably what is what is you know like the um, the opening apps that are going to happen with when we when we can you know like tap AI so much better into remote sensing and you know like in a sensing world that is continuously analyzing. How do we monitor systems like that? How do we as we move towards a more what I call real time geography and and then always running kind of like models and so on i think there's gonna be likely gonna be many operators that are needed to ensure that those things are not going out of, uh, out of crazy so um so, yeah yeah so those are things you know like the the patrolling the ensuring that you know like the models are aligned that you know we're not going out of uh, that that i to me it sounds like it's going to be uh, uh, an important role i i think this is a, a nice place to start rounding the conversation off um well one of the things I like kind of asking to, to to close this conversation is about uh, is a book or a podcast recommendation, uh, and and there's a couple reasons why I do that. The first one I think is it's a great way to learn more about people and what they're interested in, and the second is just that um, I'm always in the lookout for new things, and it's uh, these travel mostly through word of mouth and and through recommendation. So I'm curious if there's a uh, one book and, and one podcast, if you listen to any that you read, listened to recently, that's worth just people knowing about. Uh, it doesn't have to be about anything that we, we talked about, uh, just interesting stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, like it sounds like you probably most people will know about this one, but it's just one of my favorite podcasts of all times is for economics. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously, I mean, like I think, you know, like the, the way that they, uh, explain, you know, like a specific, uh, many topics, right? I mean, like I was listening the other day, uh, you know, one of their podcasts around this kidney transplant program. It is, it's an unbelievable good, you know, like a story. And the way that they look about, you know, like, uh, 
these topics from a, a economic, you know, like economist kind of like point of view and very scientific and distilling it this way. I, I find it fascinating and it's something that I, I, I like very much. So, I mean, that's definitely one one of my favorites. Um, I also, uh, yeah, but th- I'll leave that one. And I know yeah, it's a very yeah, popular one. Yeah, we can leave one. it at that. Yeah. I, love, I love that one. That's one of my favorites for sure. Um, from a book's perspective, um, it has to be something then related to, uh, to to geography, right? So No, it doesn't uh, have to. No, 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 no. Anything that, um, like just, yeah, yeah. like things that you found that were interesting that you thought were, yeah, you know, just... Mm, Either yeah, yeah. if it's on the fiction side that were just great stories or on the nonfiction made you think differently. Yeah. No, but still we'll go. I mean, like one, one book that I like a lot and I actually kind of give to uh, 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 to pretty much everybody that joins the company is, uh, is one by, uh, um, it's called The Invention of Nature. It's the biography right. of, uh, of, uh, of Humboldt. I find that you know like a very 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 interesting book. I love that book, so I highly I highly recommend that. It also helps to understand a lot how we move to current you know like uh, society a little bit. It's it's the invention of obviously of my preferred domain around you know like um, geo uh, geo biogeography. Uh, so uh, which is you know like the uh, side that I, that I love, but it's also the the beginning of the environmental car like. Uh, uh, thinking uh, it's it's a fascinating book cool javier this was great this is a very cool conversation thank you very much for your time no thank you very much i think definitely i, I like it a lot and uh, there's uh i mean there's so much you know to get excited and you know like i'm passionate about this industry so um, obviously it's always fun to talk about it yeah for sure yeah i mean you're preaching to the choir here <laughs> <laughs> big time hey Thank you so much for listening to this conversation. I wanted to take a moment to thank the sponsor of this video, but also all the people who financially support me on Patreon. If everything goes well, these conversations should feel and sound seamless and effortless, but there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes. I try to research and prepare these as much as I can to know who these people are and what makes them interesting and what would lead to a good conversation. I'm incredibly thankful to all the people who support my work on Patreon, meaning I can do a little bit more of it. This podcast started out as a way to learn more about the people in this industry, but I've also started making educational content on another YouTube channel that I'll put a link to in the show notes. And I wanna make more content explaining how satellite images and maps work to a broader audience, as well as continuing to research the guests for these podcast episodes. So if you value the work that I do, I'd like to ask you to please consider supporting my work on Patreon. There's also some behind the scenes of how this podcast is done and some of the work that I'm doing for these educational videos if you want to learn more about how I do all of this. Either way, thank you so much for all of your attention and your time. I really appreciate it, and I hope you get value from these conversations. Thanks.